Hello again, Psych 370 students, and welcome to another video lecture for week 14. So we're covering applications of operant conditioning this week, right? My last video lecture was part of a Zoom class where I talked about some of the ways in which operant conditioning can be applied to home life. And this video lecture is gonna be another part of that Zoom class where I'll be discussing some of the clinical applications of operant conditioning some of the ways in which operant conditioning can be applied to treat the behavioral problems that we see in certain disorders. So for example, as I mentioned uh, during last week's video lecture, one problem that we sometimes see in children, uh, especially children with autism, but also children with other issues, is self-injurious behavior, okay? SIVs, we call them, self-injurious behaviors. So these kids will inflict harm, right? They'll inflict injury on themselves, such as by hitting themselves, pulling their own hair, biting themselves, banging things on their heads, okay? Those are self-injurious behaviors. And obviously these behaviors can put the person who performs them at risk of serious harm, right? And they're problematic for other reasons too, like social reasons. So from a treatment perspective, it's important that we try to eliminate or at least reduce the frequency of these self-injurious behaviors, right? Well, guys, we've actually known for quite a long time that punishers are an effective way to do that. Okay. And this finding was actually first reported by Ivar Lovas, the same guy who developed that language program that we just watched the video about. And he found that just four electric shocks were enough to get a boy to stop hitting himself, okay? Four electric shocks, that's all it took. The shocks were described as painful, but not harmful, okay? But the most important thing about them was that they were contingent on the boy's behavior, okay? And the boy's self-injurious behavior. So the boy seemed to learn very quickly that hitting himself would cause an electric shock to occur. And so it didn't take very long for him to stop performing that behavior. Similar findings have also been reported. So for example, in this study that I've summarized on the slide here, the researchers focused on the case of a nine-year-old girl named Sharon, who would reportedly hit herself in the nose and the chin up to 200 times an hour when she wasn't restrained. Okay, so big problem with self-injurious behaviors in Sharon. And at her daycare center, they tried to negatively punish these behaviors and to positively reinforce other behaviors instead but that didn't work. And so the researchers used a positive punishment technique with her where they and Sharon's parents would continuously monitor Sharon's behavior and they would use a remote transmitter to give her an electric shock on her arm whenever she hit herself. And with that strategy, the frequency of Sharon's self-injurious behavior dropped to zero within about a week. Okay, so it was very effective. So guys, this works, okay? The use of aversive stimuli like shocks can be effective in reducing these SIBs, okay? I should also mention, by the way, that at least sometimes punishers milder than electric shocks can work too. Okay? So for example, one study found that just spraying a water mist in a boy's face was enough to get him to stop hitting himself. And that's obviously a, a, a type of punisher that most people would find more ethical right, more humane than, uh, than shocking the boy. But still, positive punishment is a practice that many people, uh, therapists included, find objectionable, right, especially when children are involved. So even though positive punishment can be effective in reducing the frequency of self-injurious behaviors, it's not really the recommended approach anymore, okay, or at least it's not recommended as the first option to try anymore. What the experts suggest that you do nowadays is that you begin by conducting what's called a functional analysis of the problem behavior, okay? A functional analysis. And guys, that's basically all about trying to figure out why this behavior is occurring, okay? So when you do a functional analysis, you're essentially trying to identify what the reinforcers are that have been maintaining this problem behavior for the individual because they could be performing that behavior for a variety of reasons, right? It could be because of the attention that they get from others when they hit themselves. It could be because when they do this, they get a temporary interruption in or an escape from some ongoing activity that they don't enjoy, 
like a school lesson or something like that. Or it could just be that they find the sensory stimulation that they get from hitting themselves to be reinforcing for some reason, okay? So to determine what's really causing this behavior to figure out why it's occurring, you'd conduct a functional analysis of it, which means you'd analyze what happened before the behavior occurred. Okay, so what are the antecedents of this behavior and what kinds of situations does it typically occur? You'd also analyze what happens after the behavior. So what consequences does it typically produce, right? And then you'd basically conduct an experiment of sorts where you would change the environment in systematic ways that would allow you to support or rule out different possible explanations for why the person is performing this behavior. Okay? So that's basically how a functional analysis works. For example, in one study, the researchers focused on the self-injurious headbanging behavior of a two-year-old boy named Jacob. Okay? And so they began their functional analysis by just observing Jacob in his daycare. And they noticed he seemed to be more likely to engage in this behavior when other kids took his toys or tried to play with his toys. So that seemed like it was the antecedent for this behavior. Right? And furthermore, when Jacob did bang his head, those other kids tended to stop playing with his toys and give them back to him. So that's what they suspected was reinforcing this behavior. Yeah. To make these observations, they come up with sort of a hypothesis about why Jacob is doing these things, right? And then to test that hypothesis, to test whether they were right about what they thought was the reinforcer for this behavior, they did a little experiment where on some days, they instructed the other kids in the daycare not to touch Jacob's toys. On other days, they instructed those kids to play with Jacob's toys, but to give them back to Jacob if he engaged in one of his problem behaviors, like banging his head. And they found that Jacob was much more likely to hit himself on the days where the other kids played with his toys. Okay? On the days where the other kids have been instructed to not touch his toys, Jacob rarely hit himself. Okay? And so based on the results of this functional analysis that they did, they were able to identify what the antecedents of this behavior were, other kids playing with Jacob's toys. right? And they were also able to confirm their hunch that the reinforcer for this behavior was that Jacob got his toys back. Okay. So that's how they started their intervention with Jacob. I'm gonna launch another poll for you here. So you should be seeing that now. What do we call this process of observing somebody's behavior and then manipulating the environment in systematic ways to try to figure out why this behavior is occurring, to try to identify what the reinforcer is that's really motivating this behavior. What is that process called? Okay, so yeah, it's called functional analysis because you're analyzing the behavior to try to figure out what's the function of it, right? Why is the person doing this? What's, again, what's the reinforcer that's been maintaining and motivating this behavior? So you start out with a functional analysis to figure out what's triggering this problem behavior and what's reinforcing it. And that's really useful knowledge to have. Those antecedents and consequences of the behavior are really useful things to know about because once you do know about those things, then you can implement a strategy like DRA, right? Differential reinforcement of alternative behavior, which I talked about a little bit in last week's video lecture. So remember, the way DRA works, or DRO, whatever you wanna call it, is that you extinguish the problem behavior, right? So you stop reinforcing it. And then at the same time, you reinforce some other alternative behavior <clears throat> that's more appropriate, right? So DRA or DRO works. Okay? And so the reason that functional analysis is important is because to extinguish the problem behavior, you have to know what the reinforcer is that you need to withhold, right? And then obviously you need to make getting that reinforcer contingent on some other alternative behavior. Okay? And that's what the researchers did with Jacob, okay? So they made it so that now when he hit himself, he didn't get his toys back. So they removed the reinforcer for that behavior. They put that behavior on extinction and they taught Jacob an alternative behavior, which was just asking for his toys back. So when he did that, 
then he got his toys back. And that worked, okay? As simple as it sounds, that worked. That differential reinforcement strategy was effective in helping Jacob replace the undesirable headbanging behavior with this much more desirable asking, requesting, communicating behavior. So it worked. But again, what made it possible to even implement that strategy was the functional analysis of the behavior that they did first. Now, of course, once you've done that functional analysis, DRA isn't the only intervention that you could apply. So, for example, your book talks on page 264 about a case where an eight-year-old boy stopped punching himself in the face when he got reinforced for playing with a ball. Okay, So that would be DRI, right? Differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior, because if the kid's playing with the ball, then he can't also be punching himself in the face, right? Those behaviors are incompatible with each other. But in other cases, it might not be enough just to try to extinguish the problematic behavior. So in other cases, the behavior will be negatively punished while other behaviors are positively reinforced. So there's a good example of that in the textbook too where these researchers, Carr and McDowell, uh, they took a 10-year-old boy named Jim who had a problem with scratching himself. Okay, he'd scratch himself hard enough that he'd leave sores all over his body. And the researchers determined from their functional analysis that he was scratching because of the attention that he got from his parents when he scratched. So attention was the reinforcer. But his parents found it impossible to just ignore the problem behavior, so they couldn't really extinguish it. So what they did instead was they negatively punished it with time out, and they also reinforced Jim with fun activities like going to a skating park whenever he was able to reduce the number of sores on his body. Okay. And as you can see in the graph here, that strategy of combining negative punishment of the problem behavior with positive reinforcement of these other behaviors, it was effective in allowing Jim to reduce the number of sores on his body. So by the end of the study, he had almost no sores at all on his body, and he continued to have very few sores at follow-up tests that were done as many as nine months later. Okay. So um, you can definitely use operant conditioning techniques to treat self-injurious behaviors. Okay. Uh, obviously, delusions represent another problem that we sometimes see in people who suffer from psychological disorders, especially schizophrenia. Um, and a delusion is basically a firmly held false belief. Okay, so if somebody's delusional, it means they sort of cling stubbornly to these beliefs that are clearly false, like there's a conspiracy against me, or other people can read or control my thoughts somehow, things of that nature. Okay, and your book talks a little bit about how differential reinforcement strategies can be used to treat those. Okay, I've got some slides in here about that research, but all I'm really doing here is summarizing what you can read about in the book, so I'm not going to say much about this stuff. Um, I also want to mention, though, really quickly here, that another common application of operant conditioning in clinical settings is to use what's called a token economy. Okay. Uh, so that's where people can exchange tokens, like maybe poker chips, for some more desirable reinforcer, like a certain privilege or a certain product. So the tokens become secondary reinforcers, right? You can make earning tokens contingent on doing certain things. That's how a token economy works. And these have been found to be effective with not only schizophrenic people, not only can you increase things like self-care behaviors, like grooming behaviors, in psychotic individuals, but they can also help kids learn things like using the toilet. They can help older adults do things like exercise more. They can even help people who are struggling with addictions remain abstinent from their drug. Okay, so token economies are a common way to apply operant conditioning principles. There's also a technique for people with obsessive compulsive disorder where you basically prevent them from performing their compulsive behaviors so that they see that no bad consequences will follow if they don't perform these compulsive behaviors. Okay, that's an effective way to uh, eliminate or at least reduce the frequency of these avoidance behaviors that have basically become full-blown compulsions for people with OCD. Um, and then finally, guys, uh, I also, I wanna finish up for the day 
with one last application to clinical settings, which has to do with how we can restore functioning in limbs that have apparently been paralyzed. Okay. Uh, now, the idea that operant conditioning can be used for that purpose was first reported by a neuroscientist named Edward Taub, who noticed that after a monkey had experienced a temporary spinal injury, that monkey would sometimes stop using the affected limb even after the injury had healed. Okay. So it basically act like this limb was still paralyzed even though it wasn't. I mean, there was no physiological reason for the monkey to not be using this limb anymore. Okay. And so what Taub thought had happened was that the monkey had just learned not to use the limb, right? So while it was injured, moving the limb would have caused pain and other problems for the monkey, right? And so Taub figured that the monkey had just learned to get by without using the limb. And then when the injury healed, it was like the monkey didn't even realize that it could use the limb again. So it was like this sort of learned paralysis had set in for the monkey. And so to combat that paralysis, what Taub did was he prevented the monkeys from using their normal limbs, okay? So he prevented them from using the limbs that had never been affected by the injury in the first place. And he did that in order to force them to use the limb that they'd been avoiding. Okay? So they didn't have a choice now, right? If they wanted to feed themselves or groom themselves or whatever, then they had to use this limb that they had stopped using after the injury. So in other words, Taub forced them to experience the reinforcing consequences of using this limb that they thought was paralyzed. And when Taub did that, he found that over time, these monkeys did recover the use of their once paralyzed limbs. And so this is a pretty notable discovery, right? And before long, Taub had developed a version of the same technique that could be used with human stroke victims who had lost most of the use of one of their limbs. Yeah. So that form of treatment is called constraint-induced movement therapy, or CIMT. And in it, the person is prevented from using their good arm. So their good arm is constrained just like it was for Taub's monkeys. And be, they'll be given motor tasks that they have no other way to perform than by using the, the limb that was affected by the stroke. So just like Taub's monkeys had been, in CIMT, these stroke victims are given forced exposure to the reinforcing consequences of using a limb that they'd given up on using, right? And of course, the reason I'm talking about this approach to treatment is because it works. Now, it's intensive. All right, uh, it often requires many hours of treatment per day over the course of several weeks, but it is an effective way to restore function in limbs that have been affected by strokes. So you can see that in this graph, this is from a study where stroke victims had to push shuffleboard discs with their affected arms. Okay, and at first they could only push the discs a few inches, right? But they were able to go from pushing it just a little ways to pushing it much farther than that after uh, a few weeks of treatment, okay? Uh, and I wanna show you one more video today that I think will illustrate how constraint-induced movement therapy works and the benefits that it can have for people who undergo it. Reva Bowman had a stroke about four years ago. I could just, you know, minimally move my left arm, I grossly, not, not fine hand movement or anything. Here's a look at Reva just trying to pick up a sandwich, impossible for her to do alone. Weeks ago, she could only eat with the help of her occupational therapist. <sighs> Picking up these dominoes, also extremely difficult, but Reva was determined to have a normal life and body again. So she joined an intensive therapy program at the Advanced Recovery Rehabilitation Center in Sherman Oaks. It's called constraint-induced movement therapy. They put a constraining knit on the unaffected side so that they force movement with the affected side. And it's very intensive, repeated movements over and over again. They get more and more signals going to the hand from the brain. But the recovery really takes place in the brain. The therapy lasts two to three weeks. Patients come in five days a week for six hours. Again, never being allowed to use the dominant arm, but only the weakened one. 
Six hours a day, too, that's a long time. That's a lot, but it's worth every bit of it. And here's why. After just three weeks of therapy, Reva has use of her arm again. She has isolated movement of her uh, fingers now, so she can pick up small pigs, and we play Chinese checkers. And today is her last day of therapy. How are things now? Oh, much better. I can feed myself from my sandwiches. I can eat my dinner with a fork. Her improvement, dramatic and not uncommon. We have had um, people come in that have a little bit of movement to begin with, and with that movement, we're able to make the arm and the hand functional for them. They're able to dress themselves, they're able to uh, cook and food and prepare food and eat the food. Oh, I think it's wonderful. Okay, so, you know, again, it's pretty intensive therapy, right? It's not like the person just magically recovers the use of their arm uh, just because they're they're being forced to use it now right it takes it takes time and effort uh, but man you know, if you think about how much it would suck to lose function in one of your limbs then uh, it makes sense to see why you know people would be willing to undergo an intensive form of treatment like that to get even some of that function back Okay, well guys, that's gonna just about do it for this brief overview of some of the clinical applications of operant conditioning. There are obviously more clinical applications than what I've talked about here, and you'll read about some of those in the textbook, but hopefully this gives you an idea of how this seemingly simple process of operant conditioning can be used to improve people's lives, to treat their symptoms, to rectify their behavioral problems, and so on. But in any event, please let me know if you have any questions about any of this stuff, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.